Yo, what's going on, E7 fam? I want to thank all of you guys so much for helping me reach 10,000 subscribers here on YouTube. I honestly never thought I would hit this. Like, when I decided that I wanted to try really hard to be a content creator, I took a look at somebody like Coefficient, who's a fighting game and VTuber content creator, and I saw how many subs he had, and I was like, man, if I could just get like a fraction of what he had one day, that would make me so happy. And today I actually hit a fraction of what he has. And honestly, I, I literally never thought I would be here. And I don't even honestly really have any plans for 10,000. Like it, it kind of just snuck up on me, just like kind of out of nowhere. Um, I you know I did ask in a couple of my recent videos and that's just cause like it was brought to my attention that I was kind of close. The only thing I knew I wanted to do for a 10,000 subscriber giveaway video was basically give away this uh, signed poster that I have of Kitty Clarissa. I've been sitting on this thing for like the better part of five years. The poster itself is really, really rare. It was given out by director Kim as well as the rest of the team at Super Creative. Those are the people, in case you don't know, that make Epic 7. Not like Smilegate, like the actual people whose job it is to work on Epic 7. It was given out at the E7 NYC meetup. If you guys don't know what that is, it was an event with only like about 100 people invited to it, right? I was fortunate enough that a friend of mine was able to get me into it. And there were other people there, like Shotgun Shogun. It was a very uh, exclusive event, right? It was like held in like this like penthouse in, you know, New York City. Uh, there's like an open bar, all this like crazy stuff. Like it was a very surreal event, right? After I got the poster, right? Cause they gave us two when you got the poster. You got one signed by somebody from Super Creative and then they just gave you a spare poster with it, right? So you got two. And if you don't know, the Kitty Clarissa character is voiced by Abby Trot, who is also the voice of Blood Moon Haste. So here I am with this official Kitty Clarissa poster, and I look online and see Abby Trot's going to be in town near me. So I'm like, why wouldn't I just go get this sign? So I just picked up my stuff, went to a convention, went to go meet her, chit chatted about the game with her for a little bit, and just asked her to sign the Kitty Clarissa poster. And I already had, you know, in the tube that I kept them in, both posters. So I figured, why would I not get the second one signed? Maybe I just give it to one of my friends who plays these seven or someone at some point, right? I'm already here. It doesn't take that much effort to ask for a second signature. Once I became a content creator, I knew because I still had the poster that this was the thing that I wanted to give away whenever I hit something that I consider a real milestone, which is 10,000 subscribers. <laughs> For my one year E7 content creation anniversary, I did a Q and A. I thought that was really fun. I think we had a lot of fun with that video because you guys asked me all kinds of like stuff that I normally would never get to answer in YouTube form or, you know, nowadays I do more Twitch streaming uh, as well as well streaming here on YouTube. So maybe some more Q and A has happened in like the recent months, but back then, uh, I felt like a lot of my audience didn't really know a lot of things about me. So I thought it'd be fun to just do a Q and A and you know what? Why not just do it again? It's a nice chill video. So that's why a couple days ago on my community tab, I asked you guys to just shoot me with your questions, right? No matter how stupid they are. And I'll try to just answer. And we got like 60 or 70 responses, I think for the whole thing. Uh, and obviously I can't do all like 70 in a video. Otherwise it'll go on for like an hour. So. I narrowed it down to 12 questions. My Discord mods, by the way, they help me randomly select one of the people whose questions I'm answering in this video to win the Kitty Clarissa poster. So if your question does appear in the video, please check your Discord DMs because there is a chance that you are the person that won the poster. Uh, after about a day or two after this video goes live, uh, if you haven't claimed it, it's going to go to another person who uh, whose question is answered in this video. So please, if your question does appear, check your DMs. And again, thank you guys so much for 10,000 subscribers. Let's get into the questions. So the first one here comes from I am Jazz, 
who says, congrats on hitting 10K subs. The question is a little similar to Countdown's question, which is another person who asked in the thing. What initially inspired you to start creating content for E7 and video games in general? Did you have any previous experience with content creation beforehand? You mentioned having some modest success with card games. Could you expand upon it? So this is a pretty loaded question. Okay. So as a kid, I was awful at like literally every game I played. I was consistently the worst person in my play group at every card game we played. And I was like either the worst person or the second worst person at like every video game that I played. And this was frustrating to me because you know, you get done school, you go hang out with the boys. Um, maybe you play some Smash Brothers, like Street Fighter, Magic the Gathering, Pokemon cards, Yu-Gi-Oh, whatever, right? And I just would lose at every single thing that I played. And it drove me nuts because basically my, <laughs> my upbringing was basically just, you know, school, chores, homework, and then what free time I had left was games. And if the only thing that I have control over is game time and I'm bad at it, that does not sit right with me. So what I did was try to just seek out strong players and ask them to teach me what I'm doing wrong and how to improve. And a lot of times they didn't really help me and that was frustrating. And all I could do is just try to learn through osmosis and emulate them. And that worked to some degree of success, but it wasn't until I got older when I met people that I now to this day still consider friends. They actually taught me how to get good at the game. And I was like extremely thankful for that. Cause like I finally understood what it took to be good at a game. And like, I actually started to have some success, right? It was largely in card games. And that made me go, damn, this is a good feeling. I should pass it on to somebody else. So I started my own competitive CCG blog and just started like, you know, professing knowledge or things that I would want to see in the game or things people might have overlooked, how to, you know, sequence plays, how to build better decks, things like that. I just basically just wanted to pass it on uh, to uh, other people, right? Uh, and I noticed there was like a need. Oh, we don't have live streams for this game. Uh, which at the time was like Twitch was like brand new. So I was like, I can try. And I was terrible at it. But I was like, you know what? I'm helping people um, in a way that they like there's a need here. People are struggling and I can bring some help because I have at least some of the know how now to do it. So that's what got me into it originally. And I kind of left it after the first game that I covered died. And I had no interest until a couple of friends sucked me back in for the Dragon Ball Super card game. And again, I noticed the same things where people do this thing in the card game space that really frustrates me where they go, oh, here's my tournament winning deck profile. I, I got first place at this tournament playing, you know, insert deck here. Um, and here's my list. And you play this card because it's super broken. And you play this card because it's super insane. And this card is just value city. And I'm like, but, but, but why is it broken? What the hell does value city mean, right? Like, I, 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 how do I play this? Like, if this is a red deck, like how do I approach like the blue matchup? Like what is there, like, what should I mulligan for? What what are my, my options like early game? What do I struggle against? How do I side deck? And I, none of these questions are being answered. And I'm just like watching these people put out stuff for the community and the community is just praising them for just amazing content. And I'm like, I'm learning nothing. Thankfully at the time I knew a little bit. So I was like, you know what? We gotta do better. Like I, I just, I, I feel like this is a disservice to the people that are really looking for help because one of the things that frustrated the hell out of me is exactly what I just told you. When I was trying to learn a game like Marvel versus Capcom 3, people would explain things to me like, Oh yeah, dude, you just gotta, you gotta just try dash or, you know, plink here, uh, or, or this stuff. And I'm like, what the hell is a plink? Right? So all these top players, they knew all this stuff. And like, here I am as some like scrub and I don't know what any of that means. And they don't want to teach me what that is. So like people would ask in the comment section for these videos I watched, like, how do I beat the yellow matchup or how do I beat the blue matchup? And like those questions would just go unanswered and that frustrated me. So that's why I said, that's what really got me wanting to do 
serious content was I just, I wanted to raise the bar, so to speak, for what, you know, what I thought made good content. Uh, I know that's not to, not to sound like elitist, but like people were just putting in like low effort and I just, and I, I see these people who are still struggling and they're not getting the help they need. So that's why I was like, you know what, I'll just do it. And that got me into just Dragon Ball content. And I started making, you know, videos explaining why cards go in decks, sequencing, playing defensively, um, you know, all this stuff, right? That people weren't really talking about. And that led me to some success because like I got noticed, I got picked up by a team. I was doing very well at events. We had a Patreon. We were making like strategy articles, you know, releasing tons of great content for the community. And that was very fulfilling to me because, you know, I would have people come to me and I would, you know, coach them and kind of explain to them the ins and outs of matchups, you know, then, then they would go to regionals. I remember this first guy was his first major event, right? I helped, he was like, Pat, how do I play mill? And I explained to him the ins and outs, what you sideboard in, all of this stuff, sequencing. And he comes back to me and he goes, I got like fourth place at a regional. First, first major event, he got fourth place. And that like, mm, I was like the best feeling ever. Uh, and I, those are the kinds of things where I would just keep pushing on to do them. Um, now the thing is that eventually all kind of went by the wayside. Because at the time, this was like in 2019, I want to say, um, I was thinking about, I was getting kind of burnt out from Dragon Ball, right? I was thinking about doing something different. And at the time, I was playing Epic 7 for like four hours a day, man. I was like hooked. I was so passionate about it. And I was looking to the content creators at the time. And I was getting the same kind of frustrations that I was seeing with content creators in... Uh, the Dragon Ball space. Like, there were some good ones, like Deity, for example, right? Back then, but, like, a lot of people were just not explaining things. And I was thankful that my team that played Dragon Ball with me, they also all played E7. And so we were very competitive, analytical people. So we broke the whole game down, and we just figured it out ourselves, right? We figured out how to build characters with math. We figured out how to conquer Abyss and all this hard stuff, right? So at that 2019 meetup, people were lamenting the state of content creation. And I was like, well, what would you want, what would you want to see? And people were talking about guides and making characters, right? Like how to build characters kind of thing. And I was like, you know what? I could do that, but that would be a betrayal of my team and everything I'm working for here. Uh, the people who are depending on me at like that I'm, I'm teaching and helping with like, cause I was doing like weekly lessons and, and stuff with people sitting with them and helping them out uh, and all that stuff. And I was just like, I just don't have the time between my, my nine to five job and all the DBS stuff to make E7 content. And at the end of the day, I was also just really, really um, worried that if I pivoted to E7 content in general out of Dragon Ball, that the people that were watching me weren't watching me for me. My audience was watching me for Dragon Ball, not because of me. Right, so if I had switched to a different game or a different genre, then I would lose my audience and I would lose all of that camaraderie and friendship that I had with my community. And that terrified me. So that was what kept me away originally. And it only took like a year or two after that. And, you know, basically it all fell apart. Uh, some people who didn't like me basically kind of set me up uh, and I basically got pinned with a bunch of drama and people who didn't want to believe me or trust in me, people I called friends, they just abandoned me. And overnight I just lost my audience and it just broke me because I literally spent the better part of 10 years across two community, you know, two communities that largely have some overlap and people were just that quick to just not side with me. It's like, what was the whole point of helping everyone if everybody was this quick to dismiss me? So that broke me and put me in a pretty dark place for a while. Yeah, and uh, it took a while, a lot to recover from that. Like my friends that were on my team uh, from Dragon Ball, the people that were into E7, they helped me get back up on the horse, right? Uh, my best friends, they helped me get back up on the horse. And they were like, I was mentally in a better spot. And they're like, you should 
really consider the E7 thing now. You should really consider the E7 copy creation. And I was like, nah, I just, I can't put myself through that again. I can't put myself out there to get hurt again. <laughs> and then I started looking at the state of consecration again. And I was like, people are begging for it. It's, I, I need to, I need to do something. And I, I just can't sit by on the sidelines when I see people are struggling. Uh, in the same way that I was when I was a kid. So I was like, screw it. I'm going to just make E7 content. So that's a pretty long answer, but there you go, Jazz. <laughs> Second question comes from Irish Pirate. In all the time you have had as a content creator, what is the moment you will never forget or your proudest moment other than reaching 10k subscribers, of course? And likewise, what is the moment you wish you could forget? You're my most watched content creator for E7. Thank you for what you do, Pat, and I wish you 10,000 more. Thank you so much for making it. And thanks for making it. Building characters so easy, especially for a turn two player like me. Let's go, turn two players, baby! Let's go! Yo, thank you. I'm so happy that I'm your favorite. That means a lot. Thank you. Um, so two. One from my Dragon Ball days, uh, uh, and th the other two are obviously from, uh, uh, the E70. So, the first time I went to a major event in Dragon Ball after being a content creator for some time, I had somebody come up, shake my hand. They were so happy. They were like, oh my God, it's you. Thank you so much for your content. I've watched all your videos. You're the best. Uh, I've learned so much from you. You have like just the best takes in the community. I cannot thank you enough, man. You've made me a better player and so on and so forth. Like just gushing praise. And I was like, oh my God, like this is, you know, it was all worth it when I see this reaction like this. And he goes, yeah, Eggman, it was wonderful to finally meet you. And I'm just like in the back of my head. Eggman? I, I, I'm not Eggman. So, Eggman is um, another content creator in the CCG uh, space, Hayden. He's a really good dude if you're into card games, especially Bandai card games like One Piece. I highly recommend checking out his channel. But for a while there, it just became like a meme. Like, people were referring to me as Eggman. Because it was just like, damn, dude. Like, <laughs> this guy hit me with the gushing praises. The first time I had really um, met like a fan after being a content creator on YouTube. And that was the response I got. And I was like, huh? I was like so bewildered by it. Uh, as for E7, uh, it's Orbis Caster Clash. It's not close. That is both the proudest moment and the one I wish I could forget. Because <laughs> uh, it's obviously the proudest moment because Smilegate took a chance on a nobody like me to become the... Uh, you know, potentially the official caster for their game. And that made me stoked. Like, I was relatively unknown, a nobody, uh, and they took a chance on me. I think before OCC, I had, like, only two or 3,000 subscribers on YouTube. And that level of exposure was just massive because, like, people who had never would have given me a second chance gave me a chance. Like, they would never have looked at me, right? They gave me a chance because of that event. And I got five kick-ass friends out of that. Teresa, uh, Prof, uh, Lucent, uh, Divine, Valky. Like, see, these are people I talk to, like, regularly on a day-to-day -day basis now, and I've learned a lot from them. So that is definitely, like, the proudest moment because it was just, like, maybe I made it. <laughs> like, I left an impression on somebody. Um, but, yeah, obviously, I didn't win that competition. It's because of how badly I bombed at one point. And this is, goes back to what I was saying. Like, um... That, like, level of hurt, of, like, backstabbing that I had had where I lost everything, that always is in the back of my mind. It just gives me this doubt. Like, it's just, like, a constant second guessing of, you know, is this the right thing to do? <laughs> and, uh, like I said, it, it, it hurts. It hurts. Uh, and I, I still think about it to this day. I'm not ever, I'm not 100% over it. Uh, and, like, that stuff started to seep in the back of my mind, like, uh, in that moment. And I froze up and I panicked. And I just lost it. And I'm not proud of that moment. Like, not even a little bit. Third question comes from Enoch. Have you always seen yourself doing what you are doing right now? Congrats, Sue. Thank you so much for the congratulations. Um, no, actually, um, I've had a pretty, like, rocky road to get to where I'm at right now. Um, and I, like I said, it's still kind of... I feel like I'm getting too old to be doing this. So it's just like... To give you like an example, I came when I came out of college, I could not get a job doing the things that I went to college for, and it really like hurt. 
And the thing that kind of kept me going is at the time, the blog that I ran and the performance I had for the game I was on got me a consulting gig at uh, a card game company. And I thought maybe I could make a living doing card games. And I was working that and I was loving it. And then I got let go and it sucked. But I was like, okay, well maybe like I I've done this for a little bit now and I'm pretty good at card games. Maybe I could, I can uh, become like a designer for like Magic the Gathering or something, right? And I really wanted to do that. Um, and then I got offered to help make an indie game, an indie card game. And um, without getting too involved in it, um, I poured like a year to two years of my life in that thing. And it ended pretty disastrously, like pretty terribly. And I was just lost on what I was supposed to do, right? And so that's around the time when I started becoming the content creator for Dragon Ball. Thinking, hey, I could do this. Maybe. Maybe I could become a card game YouTuber. And then, like I said, that kind of self-destructed. And so I'm just sitting here going, why is it everything I touch it just goes to crap? So, yeah, here I am now as an E7 content creator. And I'm just like, if you'd asked me this, you know, 10 years ago, no. I would not have thinking. good. That I would be in this spot. I would have thought maybe I would have like a comfy office job, uh, or you know, or that the indie game I was working on would have succeeded, uh, and you know, I would have, or I would have been a card game designer at something like Wizards, right? I would have thought I would have been all of those things, but nope. Here I am now. Hopefully that answers your question. Uh, so question number four comes from Bang Poof. Congratulations! Thank you. Been loving your content since so I decided to commit to E7 properly, and you're my uh, by far my favorite content creator to watch. Thank you, thank you. I was wondering if you'll ever start making YouTube videos for CCGs. It's a genre game I love, but I always get burned out really quick there. Also, any good card games you'd recommend with a fairly stable meta that don't require a huge amount of investment? Okay, there is a reason why in the card game community we refer to it as cardboard crack, because drugs would be cheaper. All right? So, as far as making videos for ccgs i have in the past right for dragon ball you could if you look hard enough you could find you could probably find stuff by me uh, i was under uh, the 3xg get good gaming umbrella uh so you could probably find some of my old stuff uh as far as ccg stuff i made stuff for universes for my hero academia i was one of the innovators in the early game for momo yaoyorozu you could probably find my deck profile here on this channel for it and I have a side channel that I don't really upload to unless, like, I just have something I'm passionate about, about card games that I want to put on there. Um, I, in the first set of Lorcana, I won a 1K tournament with an Elsa control deck. Uh, so, yeah, I definitely made CCG content. It's there. It's just I don't make it in abundance. But as far as card games, I'd recommend getting into. Okay. If you are a casual player that is not trying to play competitively in any game, just learned to play commander for magic the gathering it is by far the most played game outside of like Yu-Gi-Oh and pokemon in like pretty much the world at this point if you just go look up a local game shop find when they're playing commander it's no stakes casual play four player free for all and the reason i'm recommending it is because not only is it great fun a great way to unwind a great way to make new friends is that the price point for jumping in is pretty like cheap for about 45 to uh us dollars or so you can pick up a pre-con for commander and it's pretty much good to go outside of the box and with like depending on which pre-con with like maybe only 20 to 30 bucks you can make a pretty powerful uh upgrade to the deck and it can kind of hold its own against some of these people who've dropped like tons of money into their decks i think commander is probably just overall the safest thing. Magic the Gathering Commander is probably the safest, easiest, cheapest thing to get into if you just want something to scratch the card game itch. If you were looking for something that is competitive 1v1, Shadowverse Evolved, I think, is the game. It is incredibly cheap to get into. It is very, very high skill cap, uh, and it's designed by people who really understand what it takes to make a good card game. It's designed by a Magic Hall of Famer. The only problem with Shadowverse is that it doesn't really have a lot of people playing it. Uh, the locals for it usually only have like four to six people, so it's very hard to find a group of people to play that game. 
But if you're looking for the best 1v1 game you can play competitively that doesn't cost a lot of money, my answer is to go with Shadow. So question five comes from Shadow Bob, who writes, congratulations, Pat. I've been watching your videos since the start of the game, and I wouldn't be this far today without you. Thank you. Thank you for the kind words. This is my question. If you could be a character in Epic Seven, who would you be? So most of you are probably thinking what Tristan thought when he saw this question, which is you just pick Sermia, right? No, I, I probably wouldn't. If I had two that I would pick, uh, it would be either be Elagos or Selene. Uh, I think Elagos is just a really cool character. Um, the whole Dagger Sakaar thing is really cool. He gets into these really interesting situations. Like, Episode 5 has really sold me on him. I already thought he was a cool character. Episode 5 has made him one of the coolest characters, I think, in the entire game. He's just really, like, suave and secretive. And he seems very strong and, like, very knowledgeable and intelligent. Like, he just seems like an overall, like, well-put-together cool character. And I wouldn't mind being him. Uh, Celine is just, I guess, purely for, like, selfish reasons, because she's, like, stupid strong, and she just gets to adventure and wander the world without a care, like, at all. She just gets to just do whatever the hell she wants, and she's strong as all hell, and she's cool. Like, that's, that's kind of it. Like, I like, I like sword girls, and I think Celine probably has the best situation of the bunch. Like, Corinne's tied her down with, like, policing, Sermia's always in debt, right? And it's just like, well, what about Celine? Aside from being an idiot, like, she just gets to do whatever the hell she wants and nobody can stop her because she's just BS strong. So I think that's probably well, the two I would go with. Question six comes from Primark83, who writes, what Epic 7 collab do you want the most and who would the three characters be? And if you want to answer as well, what would the classes, skills, and color type be? RGB, uh, Moonlight, so on and so forth. All right, so this is pretty much cheating because... If you've watched the one and only Nike video that I put out on my channel, it is for my dream collab, which is Near Automata, which was by far, in my opinion, the best game in 2017. Yes, I know Breath of the Wild came out that year. That is my favorite game from that year. I think it is one of the top five games I have ever played in my entire life. So that is the collab that I want. It is literally my dream collab. And obviously, the game only has three characters, which are 2B, 9S, A2, right? As for classes and skills, uh, A2, uh, I'm sorry, 2B would be a knight because she's the defensive one of the group. Uh, 9S would either be a mage or a soul weaver because he's more of the debuffer of the group. And then A2 would be a warrior because she is straight up just a berserker uh, that just uses like, you know, heavy weapons. Like there, there's, she's the offensive melee character of the group. So it would be those three characters, those three classes. On to question seven, which was from Spider613235. Hi, Sue. Question. You become the head of the Epic 7 team under Smoggy. You have your first meeting with them. What are the three main changes that you would bring to the board to get done? Okay, so I think that the three big things that this game needs are we need to do something about the no nerfs policy because like game balance is bad. We have to come up with a, game, a plan for game balance. Now, if we're not open or receptive to nerfing things, then we need to find a way to like kind of soft reset the game in the sense where it's just like if the game is all about x we need to make the game more about y i think as much as i was hard on the third ban our third pick not being able to be banned when it was originally announced that is exactly the kind of move that you need for a game like this it completely changes the dynamic of the game you need to make changes that completely shift the paradigm of the actual game, right? Like, we're not playing the same game anymore. Like, instead of being like, oh, we're playing, uh, you know, we're playing chess, right? You go, okay, well, now we're just going to change the rules on you, and we're playing, like, I don't know, like, Mahjong or something else instead. A game, a game with completely different rules. That's kind of what this can't ban third pick kind of has become. It's kind of flipped it on its head, where normally you'd want to take openers first. It's terrible to take openers first now, it feels like. So it's better to take them in the tail end of the draft. And it has completely changed our perspective on how we see the game. So I would want something like that. And it seems like they've kind of accomplished that. The other two things, and I've preached these a lot. Um, second one, monetization in this game is trash. Just compare it just straight up. The, the amount of things that you get for the money spent is terrible. And like the stuff that's in the shop is never really worth the money. Or it just contains nothing that I'd want to buy. Whereas, you know, conversely for other games in the genre, I feel like 
Nikkei, for example, has so many things in the shop that I would love to buy all the time. And I really think that they should look at what makes that shop so great and try to emulate that a bit better. Because right now, as free to play friendly as Epic 7 is, when it comes to spending money in Epic 7, I think they are probably the worst gotcha game uh, that I can think of in terms of how well your money spends on the game. So I definitely think that's another thing that we have to address. Uh, and third and finally, man, gearing in this game is just, it's just trash. It needs to be better. I just don't know in year five how a newer player is supposed to catch up with veterans with the current state of gearing. We need more charms. We need to find a way to reduce more RNG, uh, more ways for players to very easily acquire like epic 85 gear with like decent subs. Like it should not be this hard to get gear in Epic 7 and play the characters that you want to play. Like, Star Rail has kind of, I feel like, perfected the gear grind RNG at this point because a character comes out and I could basically no life grind for like a week and I'm pretty content with building that character. If I try to no life grind for a week in Epic 7 to build a character, uh, I might have like one or two pieces and I still need another four to go, which is uh, not a good feeling. So. Those are definitely the three highlights I think that need to be fixed. And that's what I would definitely focus on. Question eight comes from, uh, I assume it's pronounced zombie. Uh, hey Sue, what motivated you to become a streamer? I also, what's your top three anime of all time? I've already basically answered the first question uh, earlier in the video with Jas, but uh, this other one, what are your top three anime of all time? I also kind of answered this one in a previous video, the first Q and A, but some of you may or may not have seen that. Uh, my number one anime of all time, even though I don't, think objectively it's the best anime it's just my favorite and the one that i have really fond memories with is tenshi muyo specifically tenshi muyo ryo oki it is the original harem anime and the main reason that i love it is because my favorite character from that series is ryoko she is just a walking train wreck of a person and she's one of the few waifus that could probably straight up beat goku so when people say but can they beat goku though yes at full power my waifu probably could so that is one reason that I like it. As for after that, it's kind of hard. Uh, objectively, I think Full Metal Alchemist and Tang and Topa Gurren Lagann are probably the next best, like the best two I could think of off the top of my head. But I'm really particular to things like Ghost in the Shell and Neon Genesis Evangelion. Speaking of Ghost in the Shell, shout outs to the Major. Uh, yeah, those are definitely some of my favorites. Question number nine, Nuns with Guns asks, what literary work left a strong impression on your way of thinking? This is a, a fun way of Nuns admitting that he hasn't watched all of my content because I literally made an entire video discussing a literary work that left a strong impression on my way of thinking. And that is the Five Rings video based on the Book of Five Rings by Miyamoto Musashi. It is probably one of my favorite videos that I've ever made. I didn't do the best job editing it. I kind of rushed through it because I was so passionate about it, but I think it's worth a watch. I know that Tristan has said it's probably like his favorite video I've ever done. It, he was kind of blown away by it. And I believe even one of his kids picked up the book as a result of that video. So yeah, uh, please go watch that video. Question number 10 comes from our resident troublemaker on Twitch, Volcanics. Volcanics writes, how do you manage the balance between catering to your existing fan base's expectations and exploring new content ideas to keep your channel fresh and engaging? Also, please enable text-to-speech. No on text-to-speech. I've seen what you do to other streamers. No shot. No shot is that happening, at least not anytime soon. As for your actual question, I like to think of it, or at least how I would approach it, is similar to a response that Maximilian Dude gave to a fan. So if you don't know, Maximilian Dude is probably the biggest fighting game content creator on YouTube and probably Twitch as well, right? So a fan asked him, about getting into content creation and like how would he get into it and things like that what should he do what kind of game should he stream what kind of content and max's response was just essentially make the content that you enjoy uh, and you would want to see and the viewership will come right like that's just what it is just be genuine be honest make the things that you find enjoyable and that you would actually want to make right so I know that people have expectations uh, and they want me to like explore potential new ideas, but that's literally all it is. I'm just honest with myself. If I don't think a video idea is good, I'm not going to make it. 
if I think that a video is not up to my personal standards, I'll trash it, right? I, I just, I want to make things that I think are good or I think are fun or interesting, right? And my hope is that my audience is understanding of that and they'll, you know, keep tuning in. Like, if you guys hate it, like, then I, I don't know what to say. Again, I'm just trying to be honest with myself and what kind of content I would want to see, what kind of change I want to bring to the world. Question 11 comes from Clevy, longtime viewer of the channel, or Clevy, as I jokingly call him. So Clevy writes, congratulations, brother. Thank you so much. But don't stop yet. The grind never ends. I agree. It never does end. So Clevy writes, coffee or tea? All right, I'm going to go with the third answer and say neither, <laughs> because I actually despise both coffee and tea. I have been trying to drink coffee for I don't even know how long, like a, a really long time. Everybody keeps trying to tell me I need to drink coffee. Like, like how do I exist without coffee? How am I, do I survive without it? Maybe I just haven't found the right blend, right? I have tried all different kinds of blends of coffee. I've tried it, you know, black. I've tried it with cream and sugar. I've tried like, you know, Irish cream, hazelnut, like all these different things, right? I just think I do not like the base taste of coffee, right? I just, I, I don't know. I'm not like very big on like, like the bitterness or like the earthy like taste to it. It's just, it doesn't, it doesn't do it for me. It literally feels like I'm drinking like muddy water. I just, I can't, I just, I cannot drink it. I've tried, I, I cannot. So I, I despise coffee, like everything coffee flavored, right? I just, I hate it. Tea, I'm a bit more forgiving on. As a kid, I used to drink some tea, but it was never like my first choice, right? Like iced tea, green tea, like, like these things are like drinkable, but they are like super far down my list. Uh, on things that I would actually like go out of my way to drink, right? Uh, it's super awkward now because like people always ask me if I want to get like boba and I'm just like, I don't, I, I don't know, man. Like it's all right, I guess. Like it just doesn't do anything for me. So between the two, it's tea uh, by a mile. But at the same time, I really don't like either. And our final question comes from Divine Shadow 77 <laughs> Who says, when the fuck are we playing Dokapon Kingdom? So, <laughs> for some context, during the Orbis Caster Clash, we all were in Prof Boy's hotel room and he invited us over to play Mario Party after the whole competition was done. And I was talking about how I didn't really care for uh, Mario Party because Dokapon Kingdom, in my opinion, is the superior version of the game. Because it is, as the game describes it, the friendship ruining game. It is absolutely brutal and will make you hate existence. And I jokingly said that, you know, since we're all content creators, one of these days we should do a, like, collaboration where we're all on stream together playing Dokapon Kingdom. Like, maybe it's, like, me, Prof Boy, Divine, Valky. Like, that's the four players. And do Dokapon Kingdom because I think it'd be really fun and really enjoyable. The problem is is that a average game of Dokapon Kingdom is like 12 hours. So, um, you gotta be really committed for this game. It is not a short game, right? So, what ends up happening is about like an hour and a half to two hours into Dokapon Kingdom, somebody starts hating existence and just trying to just completely fuck up the game for everybody else. Like, you know, like the person in last is just like, I got no, I got no gold, I got no resources, I have no items, I got a turd on my head, yes, an actual turd, I, I alright, screw this, and then they just sabotage the game, like, somebody will get to that point, that's why I said it's the friendship ruining game, so it, 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 it's very difficult to get a group of people together to play this game, but trust me, so badly want to stream this game and I, I want to see if people actually want to watch this if you want to watch this please let me know down in the comments below but yeah that does it for the uh the 10,000 subscriber q a uh if i like didn't answer your question you really want me to answer it like just pester me again on discord my links to all that stuff uh is down in the description below also um just for the hell of it because i know people are asking about card game stuff um 
I'll just link like one or two of my videos in the description as well as like my commander deck. So if you guys want to see what I actually play, uh, that's not Epic Seven, like some of my card game related persona stuff, I will link that down below. Thank you again so much for all the continued support. Here's to whatever the next milestone brings us to, uh, whether that's, you know, 15K, 20K, I, I really have no idea. Sky's the limit. I'm going to keep trying to do what I do best, which is provide you guys with honest quality content. And, well, a couple of guides. If you're watching this when this airs, a couple of guides should be coming down the pipeline. Uh, Celine's almost done. Working on haste. Big content creation week coming up as well. Obviously, we're going to try out Wuthering Waves, which is like the new it game. I just want to see what all the hubbub is about. So, yeah, expect a lot of stuff this upcoming week. So, yeah, thanks for watching. As always, enjoy the rest of your day, the rest of your week. Catch you in the next one. Thank you so much. Bye-bye now.